Okay. Uh, good evening, um, everybody, and welcome to Kinross. Um, this, of course, is a, a difficult uh, day for all of us in the nationalist movement, and it seems fitting before we proceed any further, if I can ask those of you who are able to kindly stand uh, so we can play uh, tribute uh, to the late, great Winnie Ewing in a moment's silence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you. Can I say hello uh, to all of you watching the Independence Live and thank Independence Live uh, for being here today before we start the meeting officially. And thank you very much for joining us in silence uh, for Winnie Ewing. I have asked if Alex might kindly say a few words of tribute uh, to Winnie Ewing before we commence tonight's meeting. Alex. Fine. Thank you, Tasmina. A, uh, a white picture, uh, Turriff, or Turra, as we'd say in uh, northeast of Scotland, High Street, uh, on a Friday afternoon, in a dreary Friday afternoon, sometime in March 1987. Now, Turra High Street on a Friday afternoon, then and now, there's no many folk on it, particularly if it's raining and drizzling as it was that day. Uh, when Winnie Ewing came to campaign for the young whippersnapper who was the candidate for the SNP uh, in Banff and Buchan, uh, there wasn't anybody there. I mean, there wasn't a soul in the entire high street. As far as you knew, you were the only people in Aberdeenshire, maybe the only people on earth. Uh, and it was uh, dark. I mean, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon, but it was already dark. Uh, and uh, you would have thought the chances of having any meaningful campaigning activity in that afternoon were non-existent. Well, maybe about 40 minutes later, by which time Winifred Ewing had been in every single shop in Turra High Street and bought something in every single shop in Turra High Street. So much so, there was a, a fashion shop for 20 years after as MP. They kept inquiring to me, is Mrs Ewing coming back? <laughs> Anyway, it became, instead of being a, a dreary, drizzly Friday afternoon with nobody there, it was like the, the first day of the Turra show. The place was absolutely agog. No one I've ever met could transform a campaign activity, a canvassing session, a day's activity like Winnie Ewing. She was absolutely, totally unique. But of course, her influence in Scotland and Scottish politics goes far beyond her campaigning attributes. Uh, you can define a, a life in many ways, but in politics, uh, the vast majority of politicians can adapt to the political climate. They can blow with whatever prevailing wind is blowing. There's only a very, very few politicians who can actually make the weather. Winnie Ewing was one such individual. And you can encapsulate that in three phrases for which she became known. Uh, the first was, uh, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. Which is what she proclaimed after her victory in the Hamilton by-election of 1967. And for those of you who remember or go on the internet tonight or go on the internet right now, uh, and if you put Winnie Ewing, Globe, Hamilton, 1967, you'll see a, a great picture of a very attractive young woman sitting on a world globe in a park in Hamilton. <laughs> uh, one of the iconic pictures of Scottish politics. 
And in that phrase, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. In a phrase, in a moment, she transformed Scottish nationalism from being a backward, insular movement that harped on about the past to something that was forward-looking, internationalist, expansionist in its outlook for the future. Stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. And that moment, that by-election, of course, was the moment of modern Scottish politics. Ever since that by-election, Scottish politics has been dominated by the constitutional question. Ever since that by-election, there's been a, a continuous uh, stream of presence of uh, nationalist MPs in the Westminster Parliament. After that by-election, by Harold Wilson panicked because he saw his Scottish fortress under assault set up the Combrandon Commission on Devolution. Ted Heath came to the city of Perth as opposition Tory leader and proclaimed the Tories had always been the traditional home rule party of Scotland <laughs> in what was called the Declaration of Perth. Basically, Labour and Tory, Tory and Labour had their knickers in one almighty twist as a result of Winnie Ewing's victory in that by-election. And that's been the continuous thread since. Since then, Scottish politics has been dominated by how much self-government Scotland was to get, firstly through the Parliament. We have now the argument for independence. But it was provoked and sustained and started by that by-election in 1967 and by that phrase, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. When he lost her a seat in 1970, but three and a half years later, she was back again as MP for Murray and Nairn, defeating the sitting Secretary of State for Scotland. Now, I mean, the, we now live in an era where people don't know the name of the Secretary of State for Scotland. But that wasn't the truth then. I mean, then the Secretary of State for Scotland was the biggest figure in Scottish politics. You know, Willie Ross is the Labour Secretary of State. Gordon Campbell, a distinguished uh, Secretary of State for the Conservative Party, was laid low in a by-election, in an election shock in February 74 by Margaret Winifred Ewing. Winifred Margaret Ewing won Murray and Nairn for the SNP in February 74. And firstly, seven and then 11 MPs joined her in the elections of that year. And Winnie's phrase, which encapsulated that time, was that Westminster should understand that the contingent of Scottish MPs were not there to settle down, but to settle up. The other, another phrase of Winifred Ewing's. Now, you might argue, I would argue, that not every MP has taken Winnie's advice in the period since, and maybe they should remember it and take it right now, but nonetheless, in that phrase, she encapsulated that the task was not to be MPs in the Westminster Parliament, but was to return democratic authority to Scotland. And therefore I come to the last phrase of Winnie Ewing making the weather of Scottish politics. And that, as after her period as Madame Acos, where she raised Scotland's profile single-handedly in the European Parliament, not <laughs> dramatically changing the status in which this nation was regarded in European terms, but also Things like the Erasmus scheme, the Lomi Convention coming to Inverness, the capital of the Highlands. You think everybody would have thought that a huge international conference would arrive in Inverness, the capital of the Highlands, if it hadn't one been for the influence of the chairmanship of Winnie Ewing. But more than that, she came back to the Scottish Parliament in 1999 and opened it with the phrase, this Parliament adjourned in March 1707, is hereby reconvened. And in that single phrase, made the argument and the point that the Parliament in Edinburgh was not the creation or creature of the Westminster Parliament, but a continuous thread of Scottish sovereignty stretching through history, the reconvening of a Parliament adjourned in 1707 and hereby reconvened by Madame Mikos in 1999. To have done any one of these things 
would have been a remarkable contribution to Scottish politics. To do all three of them is quite perfectly extraordinary. Now, many people here, I hope, and many people watching, I hope, will be going to Bannockburn, the annual Bannockburn March and Rally organised this year by All Under One Banner, this coming Saturday. It's an event that Winnie Ewing loved more than, than any other. And as a young politician, proudly marching along with her sometime in the 1980s, I can't remember which year, I was conscious that, that Winnie was waving at windows <laughs> as we passed. And I was glancing up, trying to look at the people she, I thought, you know, must be relatives or friends or fellow party members or people she Kent and Stirling. And I couldn't see anybody behind the windows. So eventually I said, Winnie, Winnie, I, I can't see the people you're waving at. And she said to me, well, Alex, she said, I think they're there, and if they are, they'll be very pleased that I'm waving to them and will wave back. And she said, and if they're not there, then there's no harm has been done. <laughs> she was a truly remarkable lady. We were extraordinarily lucky to have her in our cause. And at Bannockburn this coming Saturday, I'm sure that more than any other prevailing thought will be the contribution and the memory of Winifred Margaret Ewing. Thank you very much indeed, Alex. I'd now like to pass to Sally Hughes, um, who will do an introduction and welcome on behalf of Perth Lackey. Sally. Thank you all for coming out tonight on such a warm, beautiful summer's evening. It's lovely to see so many of you here. And I think it's safe to say that we all share a deep concern and interest for the future of our country. With regards to Winnie Ewing, I was born in 1969. And I remember my parents talking about her. They didn't know her. Um, they supported Scottish independence. They were so proud of her, Madame Acos. And I think that's a testament really to her achievements, one of life's and one of Scotland's finest ambassadors. So I send my kindest thoughts and condolences to her family and loved ones. And I thank her. So this time last week, I had been asked to give a speech here and I had prepared one, but between then and now, I had to get my dad's car fixed. And I always go to a family business in Perth uh, and I always get an update on what's happening on Perth's Motor Mile. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'll share that with you. And unfortunately, it's not good news. Four Apprenticeships from one of the major dealers are laid off this week. And that large, that's one of the largest dealerships in Perth. They're going to close down most of the business and just concentrate on the camper van side of things. That's six months notice most of the workers have been given. Seven car dealerships are, have already left Perth's Motor Mile or will do so before year's end. And that includes Hyundai, Vauxhall, Renault, Peugeot, Jaguar, and a rumor I, the rumor is that Ford is to go as well. Um, Perth College, uh, the Highlands and Islands University, they're talking about laying off staff and it doesn't end there. The schools are talking about classroom assistant cutbacks. Construction is slowing down even as we speak. Interest rates have gone up again today. Jobs, jobs, jobs. And don't even get me started about food prices. You'll all know, you'll all have seen, you'll all have been hurting up at least 40%. So I have to ask, do you feel better together? Do you feel like you've had your Devo Max in any shape or form? 
Do you feel like they made good on their promise that Scotland would be an equal, an equal partner, valued and respected? Broad shoulders of the United Kingdom? You would be entitled to start to feel a burning anger about the way we and our country is being treated. And if you do feel that burning anger, I suggest you hold on to it, because if you're like me, it's going to be the only way you keep warm this winter. Winter is coming, and it's not going to be good. It's going to make the Thatcher years when I was a teenager look like a teddy bear's picnic. There is a deep and urgent necessity that we get independence over the line. Things are bad just now, and they're a way to get an awful lot worse. And the only tool that's left in the toolbox to do anything about this is independence. We don't go back to labour the left cheek of the Westminster arse. And we don't go back to the Tories. We have to do this ourselves and sort out our own problems and get independence into the back of the net. Now. But there is hope. And it rests with you. And it rests with people in this room and the people in this town, and the people of Scotland. Twice in the last 50 years, twice I've seen economic pr improvement across the board in our area. The first time was when Holyrood was reconvened. And within two years, house prices in this area doubled. They'd been stagnant for a decade. And the second time was when this gentleman here got into power. It was peak austerity, job cuts. It was also a time of metal thefts. Do you remember that? Well, I was tasked in my old job to go around the scrapyards and the engineering firms and give them crime prevention advice. And it, I always asked, how's business? How's it going? What's happening? And the engineering firms all said, without any uh, exception, they all said, well, actually, we're doing all right. There's this big bridge that they're building over the fourth called the Queen's Ferry. And if it wasn't for that, we'd be really struggling. But we've got quite a few contracts coming in from that. <coughs> that was the bridge brought in on time and under budget by someone who had the savvy to plan ahead and knew the value of infrastructure um, investment. And we have hope, and there are strategies there that we can be doing to get this done. And we also have Bonnie Fichter. Eva Comra here has been, I keep get, getting mixed up with my sides here, sorry. Eva's been a long standing supporter of people's rights as a lawyer, a family lawyer, um, and for, as an independent supporter. And she is our. Alba Party's Equalities Convener. And, uh, well, when you hear her, you'll know she's, she's got, her, got her heart in the right place. So I've talked enough, and I can't welcome you more. I'm really so pleased to see you all here, and um, I'll get off the stage now and let the experts speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sally, and welcome everybody to the 56th We Alba Book event here in Kinross, uh, a place close to my heart. I had the privilege of representing Auckland South Perthshire as an SNP MP uh, between 2015 and 2017. And this building is particularly important to me because in the run-up uh, to the elections in 2015, when the SNP were choosing their candidate, who was to be their candidate. It was me uh, up against seven men uh, in the SNP. Uh, Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, I think somebody said, but I won this election and went on to win the seat. So just go show women can do anything. Uh, and I, I said I had a privilege of representing this, this wonderful part um, of the country. And, you know, a lot has happened since uh, 
since that election and indeed since 2017, since Brexit and indeed just in the last year alone, I was just checking to make sure I had the date right. This is, of course, the 56th uh, We Alba Book meeting. So we've been doing these now since March last year, so almost at the rate of one a week. But it was also almost to the day, actually, because it was on the 20th of June uh, 2022, uh, that the question of the ability or otherwise uh, of the Scottish Parliament to legislate and indeed hold uh, an independence referendum was referred to the Supreme Court. That was a year ago. I make the point in my introduction uh, to our first speaker, Eva, because uh, Eva um, and Matt and uh, joined us at Westminster this week uh, to support uh, the uh, opinion, the event uh, that we had held in the House of Commons uh, on the back of the Scot Scotland Independence uh, Referendum Bill, Scotland Self-Determination Bill, I should say, uh, which is Neil Hanvey's uh, bill, which is going, uh, which is in Parliament at the moment and is the only show in town relative to what's actually on the table to achieve um, a route uh, to independence. But as a, an accompaniment to that, uh, Neil Hanvey had commissioned a professional uh, legal opinion from an esteemed international lawyer who provides advice also to the end, Professor McCorkadale, whose opinion in a nutshell, if I'm to encapsulate his many brilliant words into a sentence, says uh, that the Supreme Court judgment was mistaken in law in its approach to the right to self-determination in Scotland. And that's hugely significant and I would implore you all to take the opportunity to please read up on that opinion because it offers routes to the way forward. But I mention it because Eva tweeted a picture of herself from outside the House of Commons for many, many years ago. I'm not even going to say the year because I shan't embarrass her. But suffice to say, when she tweeted one from then and now, I could note no difference whatsoever <laughs> in what our Eva Comrie looked like. An absolute champion of the cause. And in 2015, when I was fighting the, the election for the seat, Eva was, was there and championing the cause and going up and down all of the high streets and asking people to to vote SNP and also saying a lot of things about the Tories. I was actually quite anxious it was okay to use such words in such nice places. But I was told, yeah, it was, and just to get on with it. So I did like a good candidate. But Eva is a champion of the cause, a champion uh, for the Alba Party. I'm very pleased and honoured to call her a colleague. She is indeed our Equalities Convener, and you're going to have the pleasure of hearing from her this evening. Please welcome Eva Comrie. Thank you very much. Um, the first photo to which Tasmina referred was actually taken on the 30th of May 1980 when I was with my sixth year class uh, in London uh, while we were on a, a route to a holiday in Paris. Um, that aside, I am hurting tonight as I know everybody in this room is. It's been a very emotional day. Scotland grieves. Scotland mourns one of our very best, a heroine of our Scottish independence movement and a woman widely regarded, internationally regarded as the salt of the earth. Her memory, Winnie Ewing's memory will be of an honourable woman, a patriot, a democrat, <coughs> an internationalist and a champion of all that is good in the world. And her motivation, her motivation was that she was an egalitarian, an egalitarian internationalist, an accomplished lawyer. She was 38 years old when she was elected. She had been born in 1929. You can imagine what her childhood was like during and after the war. You can imagine what she saw and learned as a student at school and at university and subsequently in law. She was so highly regarded in the legal profession that for many years she was the secretary of the Glasgow Bar Association. Now, imagine that as an achievement by a woman more than 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago. That's how good our Winnie was. That's how respected she was within the legal establishment. She did not have to become a politician to become accomplished or to complete an impressive CV. She had done it all long before Hamilton. Now, I don't remember Hamilton, but I remember my parents talking often about it. 
in the years that followed. I remember the two victories of 1974 as if they were yesterday. And it has been magnificent but bittersweet today to review some of the photographs from then and in later years. But what is most lasting and most impressive about Winnie Ewing's record and what will be her memory is that she will be regarded as one who always invariably, unfailingly, would never be bowed, she would never be silenced, she would never be defeated and she would never be despondent because in her eyes, in her mind, in her heart, she knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that her cause, her dream would become reality and that is what we will do as we take our country towards Scottish independence. As Tasmina said, in 1980, I was at Westminster as, as a pupil at school. And earlier this week when we were there and we toured around London before and after um, the event, um, when Neil spoke about the future that he plans for us, I was astounded, shocked and angry to see the streets of London as they are, because they appear to be paved with proverbial gold, Scottish gold. It was Scottish oil that paved the streets of London. It was Scotland's oil that built most of London. And as our people freeze and our people starve, we ought not to forget the plundering of Scotland that there has been and that is planned both by Labour and by Tory. Do you imagine for a moment that Winnie Ewing would have done anything other than support a Scotland united approach as the way forwards collectively to free our country. So earlier this week, when Neil spoke in the House of Commons in committee room 11 and disclosed to the world the content of Professor McCorkadale's opinion, I was there in two minds about what the future might hold. It will not be easy, it will be worth it, but it will be the challenge of our lives to persuade our fellow Scots not only that Scottish independence is the best for all of us, but that unity within the Scottish independence movement is the only way that independence will be achieved within the timescale we require. In 1974, when Winnie was in Westminster, she began with a number of her colleagues, various different measures and approaches to try to improve life in Scotland. She continued that later as a Euro MP and she was responsible for great change, especially in the Highland and Islands, when she was able to ensure that European funding helped to create infrastructure, roads, bridges, etc. And many single track pass and place roads were replaced by better models. That happened because Winnie's heart was in Scotland and for Scotland and her motivation was to make the life of Scots better. That is also the motivation of everybody here. Sadly though, it is not the motivation of many politicians in the United Kingdom. We know from statistics earlier this week that drug deaths in Scotland are on the rise again. There are excuses made about the powers the Scottish Parliament has or does not have to tackle this. There are excuses made about how we can address difficulties within the NHS. There are other divisive areas of politics which are difficult matters for us to approach. But within Scotland as a whole, it is clear that there is anger, there is sadness and there is fear about what lies ahead. This morning I was at a hospital in Glasgow delivering back some equipment they'd, they'd lent me to try. It was a virtual reality headset which assists with physiotherapy and pain relief. My consultant is arguing with the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board to get funding for this pilot project to help others not as fortunate as me. But in the waiting room, I listened to two men, probably 50, 60 year old, talk about the Scotland game the other night. I was privileged to watch the Scotland game 
live, obviously, in London with several friends who are in the audience, Alec and Tasmina and Matt. But the two men who were talking about the game were infuriated that Scotland games are not free to view. And they went on to talk about how English, Welsh and Northern Irish games are, and they were arguing with each other about the reasons for this. But my heart was lifted when one of the men said, and another thing, we got the poll tax first. Well, that was it. I wasn't going to sit silently at that point, was I? <laughs> so I had to say, well, actually, earlier this week, I was in London and blah, blah, a wee bit of name dropping. But the good thing about it was we were engaging in a conversation publicly where men were more than happy to talk about the wrongs that are being done to Scotland. And you might think that football is just a topical thing for this week, but it's important because it's a simile for our country. And that takes me back to Winnie. She was a team player and it's Team Scotland that we need because that is the way that we will address and it's the only way that we will properly address all of our ills, whether it's the creation of a national energy company, using our resources for the good of our country, making sure our children are fed, not having to worry about whether or not we can afford nursery places or free school meals or university or college places. What happens to our pensioners? Can they eat and be heated? All of these things will be cured with independence, <coughs> but time is not on our side. I don't want when I die, people to say, there's another lifelong independent supporter gone before our dream was realised. We have to get a move on and get it done soon. Scotland United will not be defeated. Scotland United will achieve our independence. And I implore those within the SNP to read and support Neil Hanvey's self-determination bill and bring the power of a referendum back to the Scottish Parliament. If that doesn't happen, then we must have that general election run on a Scotland United ticket. And we will do what Winnie Ewing spent her life doing. We will not prioritise party or personality. We will prioritise the needs of our nation, the independence of Scotland. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Eva. Now, of course, when we started, when we launched the We Abba book uh, last year, the book is about, and these meetings are about, the case for independence. And we long for the time when we can actually sit and talk about the policies contained within this and the ideas for Scotland's future in great detail and enjoy the debates around that and look forward uh, to what Scotland has to offer herself and her people. But before we do that, we have to find the means by which we can secure the opportunity for Scotland to vote for her independent future. And Winnie's phrase again comes to mind, the one about being at Westminster to settle, not to settle down, but to settle up. And it reminded me of what Kenny McCaskill and Neil Hanvey did not so long ago on the floor of the Westminster Parliament. And it takes a lot of guts, believe you me, to stand up against the establishment and shout at Boris Johnson, perhaps less difficult to shout at Boris Johnson, because that's quite an enjoyable activity, but they did it nonetheless and had the guts to do it, to say we are not going to stand for it, we're here to represent Scotland, we're entitled to an independence referendum and you can't stop us. Now they did that and were thrown out of Parliament. That was a good day for Scotland, because Scotland proved her strength and the strength of her representation when it's used. And I bring that because, again, in committee room 11, in that very same place, Alex reminded us all of his own disruptions at Westminster. We're in the very room that he got chucked out of because he sat in on a committee and demanded to be heard, even though he had no right to be in that committee room whatsoever. Uh, and that also became a subject of, uh, of, <laughs> of great debate in the House of Commons. And then, of course, Alex uh, had the guts uh, to interrupt the budget which is a big deal, never been done before and never been done since. That is what is called not settling down. And the man I'm about to introduce won't settle down until he settles up. And his job is to help us achieve our independence. Please welcome Alex Salmond. <laughs> Thank you.
Justice Minder is absolutely right, of course. Uh, there I was uh, on uh, Tuesday in Committee 11 of the House of Commons. The last time I was on that committee was uh, oh, 30 and more years back in that committee room. Uh, and uh, Michael Martin, the late Michael Martin, was in the chair and he got very upset because I had appeared in a Scottish Education Committee, which I hadn't actually been elected to by the House of Commons. But uh, they weren't electing any SNP MPs to it, despite the fact it was a Scottish Education Committee, but I'd put seven Tories from English constituencies on it, so that Michael Forsyth could uh, implement some daft scheme he had for, for Scottish education. And Michael got very upset about me being on the committee, a very nice man, incidentally, Michael Martin, uh, and uh, was about to expel me from the committee until uh, I uh, stood up and said, well, I'm afraid, Mr Chair, you don't have the powers to expel me from this committee. You have to go to the House. Uh, and so he had to suspend the committee, so I got quite excited by that. So I thought I'd just go up the entire committee corridor and suspend a few other committees, <laughs> which resulted in a, a three-hour debate on the floor of the House of Commons called the conduct of the Honourable Member uh, for Banff and Buchan. Now, I won't tell you the outcome of it, because it went on for a long, long time, but let's just say I came out rather better than Boris Johnson did last, last week. But I'll tell you something else. I was sitting in committee room 11, and I, I, was, the, I was in more danger with Tasmina Ahmed che chairing the, uh, the, the meeting in committee room 11 than I ever felt from uh, Michael Martin. And I say that, Tasmina, in the best comradely way I can, because you told us Snow White about yourself and the seven dwarfs, the seven men who were your rivals uh, to be able to become the, uh, the candidate for Oakland and South Persia. I, I listen, if I'd been any one of these seven, I'd have thrown in the towel straight away. I wouldn't even have bothered uh, to go through with the, uh, the entire meeting. So we have a very formidable chair in the Arapa party. Uh, and in the great tradition of Winnie Ewing, you've heard some uh, strong, strong women uh, speak tonight as part of the, the, national, the national movement in Scotland. Now look, I keep hearing that these are dark days for the independence movement. That there's going to be a dreadful generational setback. And of course, unless we do things differently, there will be a setback next year. But these aren't dark days for the independence movement. The independence movement has never been stronger in Scotland. I, I called an independence referendum 10 years ago. Support for the SNP was at 50%. But support for independence as a concept was under 30%. And yet I thought if we campaigned and if we set a date, if we energised the people, I thought we could win. A referendum. Now, we didn't win the referendum, but we got to 45%. We transformed Scottish politics. Ten years later, that situation is dramatically reversed. We're now in a situation, the average of the last four opinion polls, where support for independence is at 50%, and support for the SNP is at 35%. Totally different from ten years ago. Now, in my estimation, if you get the strategy right, you're more likely to gain independence in a situation where you have 50% support and a campaign to launch than in a situation where you had below 30% support. All you have to do is get the strategy correct and have a strategy in the first place. Now, Tasmina told us that uh, uh, the uh, Robert McCorkadale opinion, Robert McCorkadale was the United Nations go-to lawyer. Uh, Robert McCorkadale was the, the lawyer who represented the, Bal the Baltic States, the lawyer who represented the Chagos Islanders in the International Court of Justice. He sits in an innumerable <coughs> United Nations Committee. He is absolutely the go-to international lawyer. And he's taken apart the Supreme Court judgment from last year, pointing out where it's erred in terms of law, in terms of the application of the right of self-determination. It's a very learned paper. But actually, if you talk to folk in Scotland about it, it's just the things we knew. Because all that Robert McCorkadale is saying in his learned paper is, look, Scotland's a bona fide nation. Nations have the right of self-determination. Therefore, Scotland has the right of self-determination. And if you ask folk in the street in Scotland, do you think we're a real nation? 
or a second class nation? Do you think we've got the right to decide their own future or should have? The answer would be overwhelmingly yes. So Robert has placed into academic terms, and very valuable it is, what every self-respecting adult Scot knows, that we are a real nation, we have a proud history, and we've got the right of self-determination. Now, in terms of strategy, going to the Supreme Court last year was, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, I don't think there's a polite word to describe it. But I did see Neil Hanvey MP from the neighbouring constituency, the Alpa MP Neil Hanvey, describe it in an article in the, the National as going to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom to ask for their permission to dissolve the United Kingdom and therefore the Supreme Court eh, as uh, making uh, James the IV's fatal charge at Flodden in 1313 look like a sensible military manoeuvre. It was a ridiculous thing to do. And uh, listen, this is not wisdom after the event. <laughs> I mean, I, before the event, myself, Neil and others, Arapa, made it quite clear that we'd go nowhere near the Supreme Court because we didn't need a Supreme Court's permission to assert Scotland's right of self-determination. Having gone there, having got an adverse judgment, it's kind of important, or should have been done at some point over the last seven months, what Arapa did this week, and find uh, and ask the world's most prominent international lawyer to correct the record. But having got there, what you have to do is a strategy. Because what has happened is the roadblock has been erected over the achievement of independence through a referendum, consented, agreed with the Scottish Parliament, and agreed with Westminster. They have now put a roadblock down and they'll sit behind the Supreme Court judgment forever and a day. And I hear you know, some people say, oh, if only we get to 60% support for independence, then it'll be different. Well, I've got news for you. If you get to 60%, I mean, do you really think people who wouldn't have a referendum when you're at 50% support will say, oh, well, they're now at 60% support, therefore we're definitely going to have a referendum that we can lose. Or I heard the PMSP, at least I, I think she is, say today in the Scots Parliament it should be 70% support. Do you not get the message? In London, they're not going to have a referendum that they think they're going to lose. And as long as they think they can sit back and say, now is not the time, as Theresa May used to say, or no, as Boris Johnson used to say, that's exactly what they shall do. So therefore, in the absence of a referendum, you have to find another ballot box opportunity. In 1945, there were 50 countries more or less in the United Nations. Now there's 200. That's 150 more than 50. It shows you lots of countries have become independent. Very few of these countries, incidentally, very few of them had a successor or a previous state who said, we really want you to become independent. <laughs> Most of them had to struggle. Some had to go through very arduous times. Many were accepted at the ballot box, but we are the developed European democracy where the ballot box prevails. In that entire Supreme Court judgment from Lord Reid and his pals, there was one paragraph that encapsulated the real fear. Paragraph 81, which says that regardless of the legality of a vote, a democratic vote, in a democratic country is always important. It has influence, of course it does. And it doesn't have to be a referendum. Yes, of course we would like one, but they're not gonna give us one. So therefore you pick another ballot box opportunity. A general election or a Scottish election. A democratic ballot box opportunity. And you have to be prepared to answer the question of what do you do if Westminster continues to say no? Incidentally, at that point, <coughs> there's a good chance to say the game's up. After all, that was the position of every, you know, when Winifred Ewing went to the House of Commons in 1967, the Prime Minister was Harold Wilson. Harold Wilson said it, if Scotland votes a majority of MPs for independence and we have to accept the verdict. Margaret Thatcher said it in the Downing Street years, 
You know, if the Scots are an ancient, proud nation, if they vote for independence, then no English politicians, certainly not myself, should gainsay the process. And she made it even more explicit to me in private conversation. So that's been the accepted norm. So it'd be a good chance of establishing that by asking for a mandate to negotiate independence at every ballot box opportunity. That is a strategy. And as Robert McCockadale points out, if you have to enforce it, then you should have a constitutional convention. You should unite your democratic representatives with Civic Scotland. You should make sure there's popular, peaceful agitation for it, and you make international appeals. Because there's lots of countries, lots of countries, who would like to do nothing more than tell the United Kingdom how undemocratic they are. And if you want evidence of that, just have a look at the progression of support the UK has managed to maintain for their disgraceful behaviour towards the Chagos Islanders. They now have five countries in the world who are prepared to support them in the United Nations. They even lost Australia after the general election recently. That's how isolated the UK are when they argue an undemocratic case. So therefore, international appeal is a perfectly valid means of progressing the independence case. Secondly, there's a lot to be done in domestic policy. Uh, Sally was kind enough to say that uh, uh, 10 years ago or so, we built bridges. You better say we built roads and all, the M80, M74, and railways, the Borders Railway, <laughs> the Aberdeen Bypass, my road as I call it, modestly. <laughs> we built lots of things. And we ran things, because in the 2014 referendum, really interesting, our unionist opponents said this, that, and the next thing. So it'll be dreadful, this will happen, that will happen. You know, the Scotland will disappear into the, the maw of the North Pole, or the world will tilt on its axis. You want to get to use the pound, or you, the food prices will go up. That's a good one. <laughs> food prices will soar in an independent Scotland. Oh, we'd have got kicked out of Europe. I'll tell you, it's lucky we didn't vote for independence in 2014. You know, we'd have been kicked out of the European Union. <laughs> so they said all sorts of things. You know the one thing they didn't say? They didn't say you can't run the Scottish Parliament because they'd have been laughed at. Because we were the epitome of efficient, sensible, logical, rational government. And all I'd say to the SMB Green administration, Every government has a duty to run things properly. That's your job. But people who believe in independence for Scotland have an even bigger obligation to run the devolved parliament properly. Because many people will take their confidence about running an independent country from what they see in front of their eyes running a devolved parliament. So when you come up against issues like uh, self-identification, or bottle schemes, or stopping fishing in a random 10% of areas, or suspending trial by jury, you know, a right that's run from pre-Norman times in Scotland, then you might well think that some civil servant somewhere thinks it's a spiffing good idea. But it might not be the sort of policy you want to concentrate on as you try to persuade a country to back you on independence. And you might also think, if you use up all your bandwidth and you start arguing with your own MSPs and thinking about expelling them from your group because they won't conform to these rather difficult, controversial, in some cases, silly ideas, then you might not have the bandwidth and the attention to run education, health, and transport properly the things you're meant to be doing to build up the confidence of the people in the ability of your devolved parliament to do the job. So I don't think this is difficult politics. It's just common sense, rational politics. Run the shop and forget the stuff that perhaps could wait another day or another generation or another iteration or preferably another civil service before you pursue 
it into dead ends all over the place. But that can be done. You know, there's a new first minister. He doesn't have to accept the albatross round his neck of these policies. He can just sweep them away and say, I'm new. I've got a different policy agenda. I'm going to sort transport out. I'm going to sort out the health service. I'm going to sort out education. I'm going to do my best. We're not going to waste a penny. Never mind millions. We're not going to waste a penny because we know that times are tough. And we want to apply our minds to settling what we can and helping people as we can through these tough times. All it requires is the application and remembering that nobody is there as of entitlement. They're there to do a job for the people and they're there through obligations of standing on the shoulders of people like Winnie Ewing who put them there in the first place. But it's not an impossible task. And thirdly and finally, there's the question of tactics. Independence 50%, SNP 35%. SNP under a cloud. And it's a cloud that's not going to disappear anytime soon. It's not going to be over by Christmas. Let's put it that way. Therefore, what do you do when you're looking at an election next year? Do you appeal on a party political basis with all the baggage that is there, all the controversial policy program? Or do you say, look, why don't we concentrate on the 50% support for independence and appeal on the principle of Scotland's right of self-determination and looking for a joint mandate to negotiate our independence from Westminster? And if you do that, if you show the humility to align with the Green Party, with Alapa, with the Scottish Socialist Party, and perhaps with independent voices of no party, yes, of course, the vast majority of such candidates would be SNP MPs. There would be SNP Scotland United for Independence. But it wouldn't be just the same of saying this is part of the party political bandage. It would be an appeal to the national movement, to the pride of Scotland and our right of self-determination. It would be something entirely different to present to the people. And at a stroke, if that were done and embraced, and instead of wondering how many seats Keir Starmer's Labour Party were going to win, for goodness sake, Keir Starmer. I mean, he's not the most formidable Labour politician I've ever seen in my life. I, uh, I saw a, a show in, uh, in London last night, Spinning Image. And uh, it was a, I mean, if I'd been uh, a Conservative MP sitting there, I wouldn't have been very happy. I mean, uh, uh, the Home Secretary was portrayed as the poor, unfortunate, possessed girl from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, that horror film of all these uh, years ago, The Exorcist. But she was going round in circles as she was trying to condemn this year, that year, and the next year. And so this wasn't a very pro-conservative presentation. I mean, I liked it fine. <laughs> you know, if I'd been an English conservative, I'd been shuffling uncomfortably in my seat. But Sir Keir Starmer, he was the joke of the evening. He kept coming along and saying, uh, yes or no answer is what I want. Do you want my help to save the situation? And they always said, no. Things are not as bad as we require the most boring person ever to occupy the opposition front bench in history to come to our rescue. So listen, this is not a formidable bunch. They couldn't burst a paper bag if they were presented with a Scotland United coalition, an appeal to the national movement, an appeal to the 50% of people who believe in Scottish independence. And if collectively we understand that addressing a country where 50% of people support independence is a fundamentally stronger position than we had 10 years ago. All it requires is politicians with the wit and the wisdom to arrange the furniture in such a way that Scotland can win. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Alex. Now we are going to move uh, to questions. I have some written questions in here, and then we'll move to questions from the floor. Uh, the first question is from Craig, and Craig has asked that I ask the question. Craig's question is, um, and Eve, I'll come to you uh, first. With trust in almost all institutions at an all-time low, 
law, financial, police, politics, media, the list goes on. Has there been a better opportunity to take the lead and bring real change to this failing country? And I think by failing country means union, uh, union of the United Kingdom. Eva, will there ever be a better time or is there a better time than right now? I don't think it really matters whether this is a good or a bad time. I think that Scotland cannot afford to wait any longer. Um, we had in 2014 the onus on us in the independence movement to explain why independence was the answer. I think now the tables should be turned and it is really for others to justify why remaining in the union is the right thing to do because all we see in Scotland daily is, in effect, the theft of Scottish resources to bankroll a UK which is becoming increasingly more London-centric. So there is a lack of confidence in all the public institutions of the United Kingdom. I think the time is right to, as we said earlier and as Alex said most eloquently, to persuade those who believe in independence to understand that Scotland, standing on her own two feet, will always do things better than the United Kingdom can do for its constituent nations. If we cannot persuade people to support independence, we will do what we don't want to do, which is to prove that we are not too wee and we're not too poor, but perhaps we are a little on the stupid side. So I would suggest that not only is the time right, it is utterly vital that we progress towards independence sooner rather than later, because otherwise Scotland is likely to become the desert that we all fear. You see that every week when you watch Kenny McCaskill particularly talking about energy theft and about uh, issues to do with just transitions in the oil and gas industry and what has happened with the reverse wind auction. So Scotland's power in Scotland's hands is where we need to be and we need to do it now before it's too late. Thank you, Eva. <laughs> Alex, you alluded to in your opening remarks about Theresa May saying uh, now is not the time as if they had the ability or uh, that we should give them the place to tell us when we can have a referendum. Uh, are you of the view that we just keep keep asking the same questions and letting letting them tell us when the time is right, or do you think it's time just to seize the reins for ourselves right now? No, uh, uh, as I was saying, Taz, that uh, I think the, the right way forward is to look for an electoral mandate at an election to negotiate independence. Uh, that, that's what you do when your opponent stymies you. You up the ante. You don't back off the table. In terms of trust that Craig was talking about, the, the trust depends on restoring the reputation of the Scottish Parliament, but that can be done. Even now, with all the various controversial things that have been happening, uh, and the answer to the question, who do you trust most, Westminster or Scotland, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Parliament wins. Uh, you might say that's because the Westminster Parliament's been behaving even more appallingly. There might be, but that's the situation. So sort it out and you get trust restored that way. But also there's a, to get people aware of the opportunity as well as the danger. Uh, both uh, uh, Eva and Sally told us of the danger of uh, this energy rich country going into next winter with a position of fuel poverty. Maybe we should stress the opportunity. In Scotland played uh, Norway at football last Saturday and Scotland won 2-1 as many folk in this audience will know. Uh, and it was an interesting game. You see, as somebody who's been watching the Scottish national football team for half a century, uh, you know, I've watched many, many Scotland games uh, where we played incredibly well, but for one reason or another, ended up losing uh, when we needed a draw or drawing when we needed a win. I've watched lots of games. I even remember a game where our two centre-halves, two centre-backs managed to collide with each other just as we were dominating a game against Russia. And so therefore, to, to win a game 2-1, uh, when uh, the Norwegians had the bulk of the play for the bulk of the match, was to be very satisfying indeed. But I'll tell you something, 
despite my joy in that result and in the prospect of Scottish qualification for the European Championship, if I could trade Norway's economic position for Scotland's, I'd trade it tomorrow and wait to the World Cup for our next qualification. Why? Because uh, 50 years ago, Norway, in comparison with Scotland, was a relatively backward country. It had no industrial base to speak of. It was a much poorer country than Scotland. It was a much smaller country in terms of population than Scotland. In every respect, that situation is totally different. In Norway, by any measurement, is twice as prosperous as the UK. The Norwegian population is increasing, uh, and the standard of living in Norway is incomparably higher. We know in Nor nobody in Norway, not a single person in Norway, not a single family in Norway has to worry about their heating bills in what are even more cold winters than we have in Scotland. Because Norway is an energy-rich country who have invested their energy wealth, which is approximately the same as Scotland's, for a country approximately the same population as Scotland's. And they now have a pension fund, as they call it, a Norwegian investment fund of uh, $1.5 trillion uh, billion dollars. Uh, and was, uh, Norway, in terms of revenue uh, from, uh, uh, from its, uh, its wealth fund, is now getting 50, 60, 70 billion dollars a year. In terms of the interest, the revenue, the earnings from its investments. So if you ask anybody <coughs> in Norway, when your oil and gas is going to run out, they'd say never, because the economic benefit is now entrenched forever. Uh, and even if they stopped, if they were daft enough to say we're stopping all oil and gas development instead of going in for carbon capture or looking for a sensible technological solution, even if they had somebody as daft as Keir Starmer as Prime Minister of Norway, it still wouldn't matter because of the wealth they have in store, having invested the, their wealth over the last uh, 30 years. So I would change Scotland's <coughs> economic position for Norway, but we had exactly the same opportunity as Norway exactly the same economic opportunity. But the interesting thing is we're about to have it again. Because the offshore energy potential of Scotland and renewables is extraordinarily high. It's higher than that of Norway because our continental shelf extends not just into the North Sea but into the Atlantic. A couple of weeks ago in <clears throat> conjunction with uh, Tasmina we went to, to film the Concarden field which is the world's largest offshore floating grid-connected wind farm. And these massive wind, far wind farms, way out 30, 40 nautical miles out, are already producing electricity. And they're producing much, much cheaper than uh, gas and <laughs> infinitely cheaper than nuclear electricity and infinitely cheaper, incidentally, than uh, Ofcom are allowing it to be sold to people in Scotland. And that is just the start of a total revolution. And as the offshore wind sector moves to floating platforms into deeper water, where, of course, the wind blows virtually all the time, you know, these folk who say wind energy will never work because the winds don't turn. Well, you know, you go 40 miles off Aberdeen and you come and find a calm day, you'll be very lucky indeed. <laughs> so that's the massive opportunity. We can produce five, probably ten times our electricity requirements from the renewables offshore now. Uh, and uh, we have it at the ball. is once again at our feet to continue my football analogy. This time, let's do what Norway did last time. Let's just say to the folk, uh, the international energy companies who were pr proposing uh, with the Crown Estate Commission to uh, give away large parts of our wealth to, actually, we're going to take 20% for the Scottish people in every field development, offshore Scotland. Can that be done? Well, the Danes actually did it last week. And they've got a fraction <coughs> of the offshore potential that Scotland has. So a public share of 20% in every single licensed field, and you then sell the energy produced at marginal cost to the Scottish people, to Scottish industry, and sell it at average cost to your customers south of the border and on the continent. You do that, and you don't only eliminate fuel poverty, but you have a massive energy cost advantage for every part of Scottish industry. And you do it in a clean, green, sustainable way that's compatible with the future of the planet. So what happened with oil and gas, in comparison with Norway, is largely gone. What happens with 
offshore renewables is up to you, it's up to the folk watching, it's up to every adult Scot. And in my view, every adult Scot has the responsibility to make sure we don't blow it the second time round. And my next question is from Heather McLean. I think Heather would like to ask the question yourself. Yes, Heather. Thank you, Then, Before you answer the question, Alex, for the benefit of those watching online who won't have heard that, um, just a question about uh, how do you keep so positive as an individual and determined? And Eva, I don't think you're getting away with this because I'm going to ask you the same question. And what advice would you give to those uh, who are sharing this journey with you about the importance of being positive and determined in achieving our goal? Now, Heather, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. Your question was so nice. I just wanted you to keep speaking. But I mean, you were speaking about it in such a wonderful way, and I had this overwhelming urge to say Glenn Morangy. Uh, but I, I uh, look, uh, well, given that the, the person who's in our thoughts tonight is still with us, uh, in our thoughts, when he once told me, when I was particularly annoyed about something or other. I can't even remember what it was. But I know it was sometime in the mid-90s and I was absolutely furious <laughs> about something that the SNP National Council had done, which I didn't think was very wise. And I was wrong. And she said, look, she said, will you kindly take a look back at where Scotland was? You know, because by that time we were starting to make inroads and Labour were panicking uh, and uh, we were within touching distance of what became the, the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and we had the initiative in Scottish politics. The Tories were floundering with no expectation of holding any other seats in Scotland. And so she just said, look, uh, every time you feel like that, instead of... Uh, getting worked up about it, just take a glance backwards. Look in the backwards mirror and see how far we've come. You might get irritated by the pace at which we're advancing. You said three steps back, maybe we're crawling sideways. You might be anxious that, that, that people stand back themselves and see the opportunity. I mean, if, you know, I like to think if I was, I mean, I know all of the SNP members of parliament at the present moment. And I like to think they're all rational folk. And, and it strikes me as nobody can't understand that unless you do something, you're going to let the Labour Party back in with a foothold in Scottish politics, something that took us 25 years to remove. So, you know, you think, well, let's take evasive action. Don't keep doing the same thing, because that's the ultimate definition of madness. So you like, to, you like to think to yourself, just keep explaining it, keep outlining it, say, saying, look, if we do that, then instead of the, them having the initiative, independence will have the initiative. But also take a look back and see how far we've come. You know, when Ewing went into that Hamilton by-election, people thought independence for Scotland was a pipe dream. People thought a parliament for Scotland was a pipe dream. People would think the idea of having a nationalist administration in the parliament was a pipe dream, spite dream. But all of these things have happened. And no doubt there'll be bumps along the road. But the substantial part of the journey, as Winnie Ewing herself believed, has already been made. So if you want encouragement, glance in the backwards mirror, see how much has been achieved, and then apply with renewed vigour of what is still to come. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> Eva. I'm looking at the backwards mirror, and my backwards mirror reminds me that in the 1960s, my mum and dad were founding members of the SNP in Creef when we lived in a caravan. And between then and now, 
Scotland, in some respects, has come on in leaps and bounds. But there are very many areas of Scottish life today which have stagnated. There are huge issues in relation to poverty. Were I the First Minister, then I would want to hope that Scotland would have transformational views in relation to that scourge which holds back and deprives so many people from birth. And we speak often about child poverty, but we don't really all understand how pervasive childhood poverty and want are. Because when you do without as a child, it has a deleterious impact for the whole of your life. It affects your ability to learn. It affects your ability to concentrate at school. It holds you back from fulfilling your potential. We know too that our attitude towards crime and rehabilitation in Scotland could be better than it is. We know that you are far more likely to be poor if you are care experienced. You are more likely to be homeless if you are poor or care experienced or have suffered trauma such as all different horrible forms of abuse which remain too prevalent in our Scotland or you have suffered from <coughs> excuse me, trauma of some other kind such as family breakdown or parental separation or violence. These are all scars on the surface of Scotland which independence as a magic bullet will not fix overnight. But what we will do with independence, and we will do this, is we will empower each and every citizen of Scotland to live their best lives, because our country will be able to use our resources for our own benefit. We will make our decisions by ourselves, for ourselves, so that our people will be fed from birth, they might have a legal right to food, a legal right to housing. We know that poverty arises in part from poor housing and housing costs, as well as the difficulties that arise purely and utterly from the horrendous cost of living that many people suffer from now. So I will be positive every day of my life until I see Scottish independence because there are hundreds of thousands of people in this country who need every member of this movement to be positive, to bring those people out of the doldrums, to give them hope, to give them something to vote <coughs> for and to get out on the streets on election day or referendum day or whatever it is and to be able to have the confidence of knowing that when we are in independent, People will be fed, they will be heated, they will be educated, their health will be catered for appropriately, the health service will remain free at point of need, and our energy, our resources, and everything that is good about Scotland will be available to all, regardless of status, privilege, or birth. Thank you, Bert. Alex, in, in response to the question from Craig, um, when you talked about in 2014, it was never a question on the doorstep, which it wasn't, uh, about the, our, our ability to govern ourselves well and be innovative in what we do. Lord George Fouts comes to mind, and I think perhaps we could answer the question uh, quoting him, because remember he, was, he said, they're doing things well, they're governing well, and they're doing it deliberately. So how about the answer, Heather, is to your question? Let's work together, let's work positively, and let's do it deliberately for Scotland. Now, the next question is from Tommy and Billy, a joint question. And the question is, can I ask the future president if, of an independent Scotland if we'll need a second chamber? Now, Tommy and Billy, I'm not allowed to answer questions as the chair. So I'm going to have to ask another potential president of an independent Scotland if we'll need a second chamber. And that's going to go to both of you. Alex first. Well, Tommy, Billy, Billy, Tommy. Uh, you know, if I'd been asked this question a few years back, I, I would have said, you know, I, I think a unicameral, a single chamber parliament is adequate because if you have proportional representation, you have an effective committee system, then you shouldn't do daft things uh, that require a second chamber to correct. I'm now becoming an alipa, I think, as considering the idea of a second chamber. I, I now I'm pretty well convinced that a second chamber might not be too bad an idea. 
uh, one or two measures recently I mean, <laughs> would uh, it would have benefited from uh, somebody saying, "Hold on a minute, you know, ha have another wee think about this." And you don't want that someone to be Alistair Jack, you know. Al Alistair Jack is the Secretary of State for Scotland, Tory Secretary of State for Scotland. He he's going to be Lord Jack because he's been promised an honour by Boris Johnston. He's keeping quiet about it uh, because Richie Sunak says if he keeps quiet about it, he'll become a member of the House of Lords. So you don't want a second chamber like that. <laughs> let's, let's say you don't want a, a, a kind of place person's hereditary piece of nonsense. But you can have second chambers like the, the Irish Senate, uh, which uh, have a PR type mix uh, an electoral base which is representative, but also calls in expertise, uh, which is sometimes useful. You don't want it to rival your top chamber, of course you don't, and you want it certainly to be small. I mean, the House of Lords, for example, is totally out of control. I mean, I, I think I'm right in saying that there's something like 1,100. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> which, uh, you know, <coughs> the, I mean, the, I, suppose, I suppose they might suffocate and die off more quickly than... Uh, <laughs> Because I think the House of Lords chamber only has room for 330, if I remember correctly. But nonetheless, so you want something quite small, something effective. But I, I think a second chamber, a had on a minute chamber, let's call it like that, <laughs> uh, might be quite a, quite a good idea. And it might be a nice innovation to have at the, at the present moment, because you know, people might well be concerned that not enough thought has been brought in to... to look, you know, in, in government, you have people in the civil service who are very keen on certain ideas, you know, who regard themselves as great experts. And, uh, and every so often, a new minister will come along and they'll say, here's another sucker. Let's try on our idea that got rejected by the last lot. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I used to ask when they came up with ideas, uh, you know, proposals, because I was always suspicious if you had a proposal presented in a... Uh, a way which looked pretty complete, you know. So I would say, like, well, did you ever give this to Mr. McConnell? And, of course, they would look kind of guilty and started shuffling their feet. So I'd ask for the history of the proposal. And what I found is that some of the stuff that came out of civil service, though they'd been trying to palm it off on folk for, for donkey's years. And it sometimes just takes a little bit of strength and, and knowledge an experience, life experience preferably, uh, to restrain the bureaucratic enthusiasm of the civil service. And that, I think, applies to some of the dafter proposals which the Scottish Parliament seems to be quite enthusiastic about at the present moment. So my dear to, uh, uh, to Billy and to... Tommy. Tommy. Tommy and Billy. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Billy. Is yes, I think... It should be considered as an idea to have a second chamber with an electoral base and expertise of small numbers in an independent Scotland. Thank you, Alex. Eva, <laughs> your view on what has now been termed hod on a wee minute chamber. I am very much in favour of the hod on a wee minute chamber, not least because of the stramash of the gender recognition reform bill where we had the spectacle of cowardly members of the Scottish Parliament being whipped to vote um, on pain, I suppose, of being suspended or sacked otherwise. And Scotland deserves far better. Because in the course of the debate on that bill, there were innumerable organisations whose views conflicted with the views of the majority of the MSPs and these people were mainly not heard or not understood or at times deliberately misrepresented. So that bill is a fine example of the way that the Scottish Parliament let us down. And it let us down very badly in the independence movement because it, gave, it provided, in effect, an own goal because it gave the Tories the high ground and they could appeal to people who would otherwise wholeheartedly have supported Scottish independence but found themselves foundering on the basis of the controversy surrounding gender reform, particularly self-identification. 
Had there been a second chamber telling the first chamber to have their wished in Scotland so that it was a Scottish solution made by and for the people of Scotland, that would be far more palatable, in my mind, far more democratic than some of the women, particularly in the Scottish independence movement, having most grudgingly to accept that for once the Tories appeared to be listening, albeit that that provided the Tories with the ability we wish they had not had. Thank you, Eva. A very generous audience is clapping every single response from both of you. Um, Alan Black, would you like to ask your question? You're next. Alan. Oh, I'll do it. Right, OK, no problem, Alan. Alan's question is, um, you touched on, and I was going to interrupt um, one of your answers, Alex, but I've learnt not to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes. That's not true. But I know that's not true. That's just uh, completely inc incorrect. Um, but we did talk about energy, and Alan's question is, how do we set up a national energy company, and could it be used to drive the Scottish economy? Yeah. Well, th thank you, Alan, for the, the, the question. Well, as, as I said a bit earlier, you take 20% of the equity in every licence you're granting for uh, offshore renewables. You use that as the equity to set up your Scottish National Renewables Corporation. Uh, and then you drive, because the great advantage of having a share <coughs> in every field, just like the parlour would be a share in every oil field, is you actually know what's going on in every field. Uh, <laughs> in many cases, over the last 30 years, uh, the Department of Energy in London were the last people to know what was going on in the, the North Sea. Now, of course, we in the national movement suspect that when uh, uh, people announced that in 2014 there was no more oil and gas to be explored or to be developed in the North Sea, it, it was all for a political motive <clears throat> that they were trying to persuade Scotland there's nothing left. I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it? You know, we're now having a debate where Sir Keir Starmer says we must suspend development of any more oil and gas fields but these oil and gas fields, according to the Labour Party, didn't exist back in 2014. So these magic oil fields and gas fields have materialised from nowhere. But actually, the most people, most governments, didn't have a handle on what's happening in the oil province, as opposed to the Norwegians, who know everything, because they're in every single field. So they have all the information that's available to the companies. And that's what we should do with renewables, because it's really important, not in terms of discovery, which is the main thing in an oil and gas province, but in terms of how the technology is working. Uh, as I said earlier, the, the great opportunity of floating offshore. I mean, I, 10 years ago and more, I opened uh, Fred Olson's uh, renewable company in the southwest of Scotland, uh, uh, which runs, uh, runs Stena's uh, onshore wind farms, mainly. And Fred... Uh, who'd run Stena, I mean, his, his daughter runs it now, but uh, if he'd run Stena basically since the Second World War, a uh, profit every year, I mean, amazing uh, company. He said to me, he said, look, the future in offshore wind is floating platforms. And of course, he was absolutely right. That is the future. And we have to know exactly that cost curve, which is coming down and down and down. I mean, currently, on current technology, offshore wind is 50 pound a, a megawatt hour. Uh, nuclear is 120, they think, but it will end up about 200. So but this is the big, big advantage you have from the big energy produced by big wind. So you want to know exactly how much the companies are making. Because if you know exactly how much they're making, then you don't do daft things like the Crown Estates did in the Scotland auction last year, when they had an auction where they had a a maximum price. <laughs> it's almost unbelievable that they did this. <laughs> so they didn't allow people to bid more. And that was because they were totally paralysed with fright with the thought that nobody was going to bid. And nobody, they thought that because they didn't understand the technology. Now, I mean, look, I'm sure there's great folk in the Crown Estates Commission, but I'm out at the CV of the then chief executive, and he's a forester. Now, it's very important to know a lot about trees. It really is. Important things, and there's nothing wrong with forestry as an occupational profession, but it does not naturally equip you to face down the international energy sector. It really does not. And certainly the knowledge and skills were lacking in the Scottish Government to do that. 
And that's why it's a good idea to have a share in every field. This is a massive, massive opportunity in which Scotland has a comparative advantage. I've already said you can make sure that no Scottish family need fear any electricity bill in the future. It will transform the cost downwards of every electricity bill that Ofgem, who all should be sacked incidentally, have been surcharging uh, families over this uh, last winter, regardless of the, the, the government's support. But the big opportunity is to give a cost advantage to our industry. It means they'll have a substantial cost advantage over the, the competition. And instead of trying to export all the energy to the customer, you bring the industry to the energy. And that's the ability that a, a major energy provider has. That's where Scotland is. We have the opportunity to develop it, to learn from the past and apply it to the future. But it's a massive opportunity. Thank you, Alex. We've got precisely 10 minutes left. I've got one more written question and then there's an opportunity for some brief questions uh, from the floor, if you wish. Um, this question is from David. Is it Greenlaw or Greenlees? David Greenlaw. Would you like to ask the question yourself? No, OK. Right, I'll ask it for you. Uh, this question is for, for uh, you, Alex. Important, perhaps, one to end on in terms of the written questions, because obviously there is a, a meeting um, in Dundee um, on Saturday. What are the chances of the SNP agreeing to your Scotland United proposals? Well, in early course, uh, not very much. Uh, there's about four or five SNP MPs at Westminster have expressed support to me. Uh, for the proposals, there's a handful of MSPs in the Scottish Parliament think it's a good idea. But I'll tell you what, uh, Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson once said, and he was dreadfully anti-Scottish, incidentally, so I probably, yeah, I probably shouldn't quote him, but I will. He, he said, if a man knows he's going to be hanged in two weeks' time, it concentrates the mind wonderfully. And I'm sort of wondering, as the evidence mounts that unless something different is done, then many people in the House of Commons, good, strong believers in Scottish independence, are going to be polishing up their CVs. It might concentrate the mind wonderfully. The evidence for it is strong. We already have had a poll showing that the majority of Scots believe that Scotland United uh, Front, a Scotland United coalition, Scotland United for Independence would represent a mandate for Scottish independence. 53% of folk believe that. In terms of international politics, there's the example from Quebec in 1993, which basically a party Quebecois at that time was unpopular, running the provincial administration. They didn't have a track record in the federal elections in Quebec. <clears throat> and then out of nowhere was formed the Bloc Quebec. Uh, by people who defected, uh, Bouchard, who defected from the Canadian Conservatives, a couple of Liberals defected. The uh, vast majority of the support transferred from the PQ, and the Bloc Quebec swept the boards, having been formed only months before. Now, the idea of a, a Scotland United for Independence coalition has the genius, in my view, of having the, the Tarty title in the name. So the candidate would stand in the vast majority of Scottish seats as SNP, Scotland United for Independence. In some seats, the two Alapa MPs and perhaps a couple more it would be Alapa, Scotland United for Independence. In some seats it would be Green, Scotland United for Independence. And in some seats, perhaps in my view, because you want to extend the coalition as wide as possible, Scottish Socialists for Independence, or a non-aligned prominent personality, been that wonderful lady who stars in Two Doors Down, <laughs> who, <laughs> who I love dearly, Elaine C. Smith would be, if you could tempt her into, she'd be a wonderful, magnificent member of parliament for Scotland United. Now, I mean, Elaine probably is quite happy in Two Doors Down and, <laughs> and her other hugely successful ventures, but nonetheless, she's a, is exactly the sort of person who'd be brilliant at, uh, at that. Anyway, look. The idea is to present the people with a united front. This is about Scotland. This is about Scottish independence. It's not about party politics. It's about Scotland's right of self-determination that's being denied by Westminster. And the first paragraph in each of these manifestos 
would be, we believe and we seek a mandate to negotiate independence from Westminster. That would be the single appeal. Now, the parties can say whatever else they want. They don't have to agree on anything else. But they have to agree on that paragraph, that appeal, that mandate. So, initially, the reaction has not been overwhelming from the ranks of the SNP. Their meeting on Saturday is not going to provide people with the opportunity to argue for it. But I think over the next weeks and months, as this argument is joined, eh, I think it might well be an argument whose time has come. <clears throat> Are there any more questions? I've got, we, we've got, I'm going to take the lady at the back with the glasses. We've got literally six minutes. Yes, with the, with the glasses on top of here. Uh, the mic will come to you so everyone can hear a question just coming up the stairs now. Thank you all very much for tonight. It's been most helpful in lots of different ways. Um, I guess what I want to ask you, Alex, is, is there a plan B just on what you've spoken about? I live in Fife, so there is no Alaba candidate for me to vote for. And if by, you know, some stretch of the imagination, there isn't a coalition, what are the plans to have, or are there plans to have more Alaba candidates so that we have the option to vote for them at the next general election or the next Scottish election? Alapa, as a party, in terms of our own political party's objectives, we are very, very focused uh, on the Scottish elections of 2026. Why we focused on these elections for an emerging party, a fledgling party, that a PR election uh, is a much easier election to break through in. Uh, and I can assure you that wherever you stay in Scotland, whether it's in Fife or the uh, Kingdom of Aberdeenshire, there'll be an Alapa candidate to vote for <coughs> in these Scottish elections. Every single ballot box will have an Alapa candidate at the Scottish elections. Uh, the executive will have to decide our strategy for how many candidates we will field in next year's election if the Scotland United proposal is turned down. I can't promise there'll be a candidate in every constituency, nor perhaps should there be a candidate in every constituency. There will be Alapa candidates, and there'll certainly be at least one <laughs> if not more, in Fife. I can promise you that as well. Uh, but it's for the executive this side. Because until we get a definitive answer, and let's remember, the SNP members don't know the answer to this just now, nor will they after Saturday. Their conference is in October, as I understand it. And if they get a vote then, we'll get a definitive answer then. But we will judge our tactics dependent on what happens. But I, I hope we can pursue the idea of Scotland United. Because, look, Alipa, I'm interested in Alipa's growth and development as a political party. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I, I've managed to be part, along with Winnie and others, of growing a party before. When I became leader of the SNP for the first time at four MPs. Uh, when I left it at the second time, it was a lot more. <laughs> a lot more. It was the dominant party in Scotland. So I know how to grow a political party. And obviously, I've got a duty and a job to make sure Alapa can do that. But I also know that the Scottish elections are going to be Alapa's big opportunity to make a huge breakthrough. And I think we shall. But uh, in addition to what we need and want and believe as a political party, we've got an obligation to Scotland and the independence movement. And we really have to try giving Scotland the best shot it can possibly have for Scotland to emerge victorious from next year's general election. <clears throat> Any other questions? We've got two more. So, a gentleman here and then here, and that will be it. If Indy Live will just give me, thank you so much. Just let the mic come to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Salmon, for letting me speak to you tonight. A warm welcome to Ken Ross. Uh, let me first and foremost say that uh, Angus Robertson and Ian Blackford wouldn't let me speak, that's for sure. Um, incidentally, the Battle of Thornton was 9th of September, 1513, not 1313, as you said, James V. Now, my question is this. Going back to 2014 referendum, a leaflet dropped through my letterbox in which, and I quote, on independence, we will create 250,000 public sector jobs, unquote. 
Mr. Salmon, it's a cast iron law of economics. If you create 250,000 public sector jobs, you will destroy 250,000 private sector jobs. How does that square up with you, Mr. Salmon? Thank you for letting me speak. No, no, I told not to Thank you for the battle of Flodden was 1513. I, I didn't realise I'd said uh, 1313. As you probably realise that uh, in many senses the, the 14th century was a rather more attractive one in terms of Scottish victories uh, than the 16th century was. Uh, even though James IV was doing pretty well until he, <laughs> until he unfortunately decided uh, on that military manoeuvre that uh, Neil Hanby was speaking about. I, I don't know the particular thing you're talking about. I don't understand think it's an iron law of economics, but uh, uh, the proposal, I don't recognise the proposal. I mean, certainly we articulated and argued, not that you would be creating more public sector jobs, but many of the public sector jobs we pay for at the present moment in Scotland would be centred in Scotland, not in London. I'll give you an example. A, a Pfeiffer, Gordon Brown, <coughs> was Chancellor of the Exchequer relatively recently for a long time. When Gordon Brown was Chancellor of the Exchequer, as far as I am aware, there was one Treasury job in Scotland. That was his chauffeur. Right? I'm not aware of any other Treasury official who was permanently stationed in Scotland. But there are, as you know, because clearly you study economics, thousands of jobs in the Treasury. You may wonder, I may wonder what they're all doing, but nonetheless there are thousands. And they're all concentrated in Whitehall. Even unlike other government departments, they are totally concentrated in Whitehall. In fact, under the Treasury building, where I've been many times, both as a professional economist and more recently as a member of parliament, uh, you actually could go down in the basement, you can open up a hatch door and you can see the River Fleet running underneath the Treasury. And I often wonder if it might be a grand idea if every so often they put some of the civil servants down that hatch into the river feet and they could disappear down the Thames. But I think the point that was being made in the leaflet was that that Treasury civil service and many other departments, that concentration, that agglomeration in London is still paid for right now by the Scottish taxpayer. Although the economic impact of these jobs is felt in London, not in Scotland. I think and believe that was the argument which was being portrayed, and I thank you for your question. Final question. Just coming to you. With all the stuff that's been happening today, uh, and the stuff that was threatened today, uh, what would you think about approaching Fergus Ewing and asking me if he'd like to sit for Alma? Look, uh, I think today, and for the next while, we should be thinking of the, the memory of Fergus's mum. You know, I've spoken to, to Fergus uh, uh, and been in communication over the last couple of days with him, but it's not been about party politics. Uh, it's been about what he and the, the rest of the Ewing family are feeling uh, and what I and anybody that I'm with can do to help. Uh, in what is a difficult time for any family. So the party politics can, can wait for another day. Thank you very much indeed, Alex. And now we're just going to move to very brief uh, closing remarks. Um, we're going to start with Eva and then finish with Alex. And we're going to thank Indy Lai for their kind forbearance. Eva. Thanks very much for coming to, to listen to us tonight. Thank you for your questions and for your participation. Most of all, thank you for having the pride and the belief in our country and the knowledge that with independence we will transform the future of each and every one of our citizens and we will see Scotland arise as a republic where we are citizens, not subjects, and we will live in a democracy with an egalitarian left-wing left of centre outlook where each and every citizen is valued and has the ability to live the life that each of us deserves. Alex. Well, as I was saying, I went to that spitting image show in London last night 
and although I was very amused by how they portrayed the Tory party and how they portrayed Sir Keir Starmer, there was an underlying theme which worried me. And it's reflected not just in spitting image, but in all of the London media at the present moment. They think with the trials and tribulations of the SNP, they've seen off Scotland. They think, and some of them are laughing, sometimes openly, at Scotland and Scottish aspirations. That hasn't happened, basically, since Winnie Ewing stormed the battlements at Westminster. And I'm, I don't want to see it happen again. And that's why, when I've been speaking, I've been saying, look, yes, there are difficulties with the SNP at the present moment, but that can't and shouldn't determine the future of the national movement, which is bigger and broader than any single political party, where we have the uh, reservoir of support, which we didn't have before, and it's the job of politicians, not in one party, but in all parties who believe in that aim and objective, to arrange the furniture in such a way as to maximise the effect. There's nothing written in the stars about this. This is in ourselves. The chance and the opportunity is still there to wipe the smiles of some of the faces of the London commentators and show them that Scotland means business. Thank you very much indeed. And with that, can I first of all thank all of you for attending this evening and providing uh, such great questions uh, for the panellists to consider. And this is, as I'd said, our 56th We Alba book meeting, and I can say with pride of all the ones I've shared, and I know of the ones that I haven't been able to attend, that there hasn't been a question that we haven't taken and haven't tried to answer to the best of our ability. Uh, Scotland should be proud uh, to encourage debate and encourage questions and not shut it down. And I'm really glad uh, that these forums offer an opportunity to do so. So thank you to all of you for your participation. Can I also thank Indy Live, the wonderful chaps, uh, Gary and Stuart, a round of applause for them. As ever, we owe so much to you because you take what we say here out to so many thousands of people who hopefully want to and some need to hear what we have to say. So thank you very much indeed for your commitment and for the commitment to Independence Live. And I will always say Independence Live has a fundraiser going. We need Indie Live. Please support them. Can I also thank tonight's organisers, Perth Laku, Denise Finlay as ever, our national organisation convener. Can I thank Sally Hughes? Uh, for her uh, tremendous opening speech. And Sally, you could be on absolutely any panel. Don't ever think you're never good enough because you're more than good enough to sit on this panel. So thank you very much for your opening remarks. <laughs> and can I, of course, thank our superb uh, panellists, uh, determined panellists who will not rest until independence is delivered. Please join me in thanking Eva Comrie and Alex Salmond. And can I propose a vote of thanks to our wonderful chair, who never interrupts me, Ms. Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh. And for those of you who are watching online, and perhaps some of you in the audience, I think that is the first time in 56 meetings that Alex has got the thanks in before the camera has gone off. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed for joining us. Good night.